We're going live with our next speaker, Alexander Osterwalder. Alex is a great inspiration to me. I have attended several of, several of his classes, read multiple of his books. The latest one I have here, which he will cover in his, in his, um, in his talk today. And I'll give you a special um, challenge out there. Whoever posts the coolest post, and this will be very subjective, gets a free copy of the book. I will send it to you no matter where in the world you are. You will receive that book. I'll make sure that happens. So Alex is uh, the founder or co-founder of Strategizer and the co-creator of the Business Model Canvas and various other tools with uh, Yves Pinier, I think is um, one of his mentors. And uh, I hand over to you, Alex. Go ahead, it's your stage. So Rob, thank you very much. Um, let's see, there's, we're gonna talk today about building invincible companies and uh, make the connection to agile because you know the, the i'm not an agile expert in terms of agile processes but i'm i'm an expert in innovation which is all about agile as well right but i'll try to connect the two worlds a little bit um and start with this idea of how do we create um invincible companies so there are three characteristics you can see when you study invincible companies the first one is actually that they constantly reinvent themselves which means they need to be strategically extremely agile. They need to really, you know, while they're successful, start to think about tomorrow. And that's not an easy thing to do, and, and I'll show you why in a second. The second one is they need to learn how to compete on superior business models. This has a little bit less to do with agile, but it means agility in terms of how you navigate the world and thinking beyond products and services. I'll try to go into that a little bit. The last one, it's more, you know, to, to round it off, um, to understand fully the picture of invincible companies, even though this has probably the least to do with Agile, is that the greatest companies today that are really ahead of everybody else, they transcend industry boundaries. You can't put them into a box anymore. They're not in banking. They're not in insurance. They're not in pharmaceuticals. They go beyond that and they play in arenas, to use a term uh, coined by Rita McGrath, one of uh, my colleagues and friends who is a scholar teaching at Columbia University. Now, what's interesting is that really the biggest innovations these days, they happen at the edges of the system. And I like to use the quote from Vinod Kosla, founder of Sun Micro, co-founder of Sun Microsystems, who likes to talk about this. But I think this is changing. And the reason is because established companies, small, medium, and big, are learning how to become more strategically agile and actually explore areas that are outside of their core. But traditionally, it's still coming a lot from startups who are disrupting entire industries and really transcending industry boundaries. So if you take Tesla, it's not a car company. It's not even just a data company with an increasingly you know, autonomous car soon, but it's really a company built around the arena of solar energy. For the, for the individuals. So think of it, like no other car company today is playing like this in this field. So Tesla is not a car company, they're extremely agile in how they're moving in this field. Because, you know, it goes across from roof panels to batteries to the cars. Now, of course, it's very hard to do all of these things at a time. So they're focusing uh, right now, probably more on cars than anything else, but going beyond that in the future. Now. I believe that acting like this is a huge challenge for most established companies because while they might be introducing agile processes, in terms of strategy, they're not that agile in terms of creating new growth engines and new business models. And this is why, because they're two different worlds. In a company, you have the exploit world, which is all about managing what you have, exploit, managing the existing, and the explore world, which is about inventing the future. And it's not that easy to do both at the same time. But I wanna also put something in here in terms of you know, just framing innovation. There are three types of innovation. And here I shamelessly steal from uh, the late Craig Christensen and friends where he says there's efficiency innovation and that is more in the space of exploit. There's, and this is you know, better processes, more agility and improvements. Then you have sustaining innovation that might be new products, new services, okay, but in the same business model. And then here you have transformative innovation, and this is the hardest to do. And when we talk about agile, it's actually often 
here. But we don't take the whole picture of strategic agility, which means you need different types of processes here, here, and here, and you need a different type of agile. So I think that's very important to distinguish. Innovation means nothing if you don't add one of these words in front of it. These are different types of innovation. And when somebody says, oh, everybody needs to be an innovator, I say, come on. You don't know what you're talking about because there's a difference between efficiency innovation, sustaining innovation, and transformative innovation. You don't want the head of supply chain or the person managing a nuclear plant to be too creative and too innovative, right? Because they're managing something very serious where you don't need a lot of downtime. So in terms of processes, this explore side and exploit side are radically different. Here it's about searching for business models and value propositions on the left-hand side. And to do that, there are two things we'll look at. That's business model design and testing. And once you've found a business model and value proposition, actually it's a different kind of agile that you go into. It's growing and scaling your business, but that's a very different ball game than searching for new business models and new value propositions. Okay, so I just wanna make this clear distinction. So I wanna talk about three things. First, I wanna go a little bit deeper in this idea of exploration versus exploitation. Then I want to talk a little bit about testing business ideas and the mindset behind that, the agility you need to test your ideas and how to do that, the process. I don't think people are the problem. It's processes and mindset and how to do it. As we've heard before in the presentation before, people are there and they actually are. They can do it, but you, know, you don't become a professional overnight. And then the last theme, if we get to that, if we have enough time, I'll talk a little bit about competing on better business models. So not just product, price, and uh, um, service, which is the area where most companies are still stuck, but really competing on better business models. Okay, so first topic, exploration versus exploitation. And if you can, uh, I'd like you also later on to grab a piece of paper and a pen or an iPad or so to sketch out, you know, I'll try to make it interactive, active, I have one or two exercises. So let's go back to this explore exploit topic. Okay, two very, very, very different worlds. So I want to start with a simple question. You can use the chat box to interact. I want to ask you if we look at this space here, exploration. So again, here it's more about efficiency. And again, agile over here is great. Agile over here is great, but it's very different. Here it's about exploring completely new ideas, new business models, new value propositions. What are the obstacles? that are holding us back. And the, what I would like you to type into the chat box is the answer to this question. What do you think at your organization are the two biggest behavioral changes required from your company to innovate big, okay? To see new ideas, new business models flourish. What are the two biggest behavioral changes you would think the organization needs to put in place? So if you can type that into the chat window, um, I get a little bit of a feedback if you're still present or if you're writing your emails at the same time. Because there's a little bit of a lag, I think, in, as usual. So I can't see your answers yet directly. But maybe, uh, Saurabh, you can read out some if you see some as well. Yeah, so one is, for example, stopping to assume they know the answers. Yes. Um, accept, accept uncertainty and ambiguity or create a joy of experimentation, get rid of complacency, make experiments. So accepting to fail a bunch of the, the regular suspects. Let's put it yeah, this way. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And that's what we're seeing, right? And, and we know a lot of that, but I'll get to that in a bit. What we actually need to have is a leadership that embraces that and puts in place organizational structures so we can see that behavior emerge, right? Because it's a different world, exploit, explore. Now, let me show you why they're different and how they're different, okay? And a little bit of explanation. The focus is different. In the exploit world, we focus on efficiency to manage the businesses that we have, okay? On the left-hand side, it's a focus on search, on the new. So that is a very different focus of what we're looking at. Uncertainty on the right-hand side is much lower. You know the customers you know your channels, you know your supply chain, right? The world st still might be uncertain, but you know your business model. On the left-hand side, imagine you're going into a new arena. You're starting to break out of banking or pharmaceuticals. 
very high uncertainty. You might not know the customer segments. You might not even know the channels or the business model, okay? So pretty important to understand the difference in terms of uncertainty. The financial philosophy, on the right-hand side, we want predictability and dividends. We want the business units to deliver. On the left-hand side, you can write a business plan as much as you want and make spreadsheets. If you're going into a new arena, you don't know if you're going to make those numbers. So we need a more venture capital style investment where actually a lot of the bets we make, they're going to fail. But we start with small bets. And then here's a big one. Culture and processes on the right-hand side and left-hand side are different. Now, you might balk a bit when you hear linear execution on the right-hand side, planning, predictability, and minimal failure. I'm not talking waterfall here. There is agile there, much more agility, but we're still more in fixed processes, right? On the left-hand side, it's complete uncertainty, and we need to be able to pivot in completely different directions, and we need to fully embrace failure in the sense that it's not even learning and improving. Sometimes it's killing projects, so a lot of killing projects, or if we use a very nice, maybe more you know, uh, gentle Swedish term, uh, retiring of projects. And the last one, super important, the people's skills on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side are substantially different. I think we have these skills in companies, but we don't always allocate them the same way. And here's the big thing. Managing something, managing a business unit, and being more like an entrepreneur and innovator, creating a new growth engine, requires substantially different experiences. So no Roger Federer, best tennis player in the world. If you're a Nadal fan, just a reminder, no no professional in the world wakes up and is world class. You need to practice a lot and learn a lot. So on the left hand side and right hand side, these are skills we develop over time. They might be there in people. Some are better at this and some better at that, but you only get better at it when you practice it. Now, I believe we do need these two different worlds in companies, but we also need to integrate them really well. And a, a wonderful example of how this has been done successfully I'll not take the usual suspect, which is Amazon. I'll take Ping An, a Chinese conglomerate that until 10 years ago was in finance and insurance. And then they decided to become a technology company. And the way they did it is they split the exploit and explore worlds into different entities. So you had the founder, Peter Ma, who remained CEO and chairman, and he focused on managing the existing but he hired a co-CEO who I would call a chief entrepreneur, so that's not her official title, that's the title I like to use, to explore completely new growth engines. And I'll give you an example of what they did in a second. Okay, think of it. This was a, a banking and insurance conglomerate. And once they create a growth engine, it actually goes over to exploit. So it doesn't always stay here. So this becomes a real, really good partnership, okay? Now, why do we need that is because the processes over here, the metrics, the culture is very different. Now, one of the examples that was very successful is this one, and it's called Ping and Good Doctor. So here's what happened. Because they said we're going to play in the health arena, and they heavily invested in that and explored, didn't get it right from the beginning, they now manage the biggest health platform on the planet with 300 million users, ping on good doctor. Think of it, this was a banking and insurance conglomerate. It's not Novartis, Roche, Pfizer, or whatever um, pharmaceutical company or health player you can think of. And that's because they, inv they invested in exploration. And when I say invest, I don't just mean money, I mean the organizational structure, okay? So the organizational structures here are fundamentally different between explore and exploit. And it doesn't necessarily need to be the CEO on the right and the, and the chief entrepreneur on the left. Sometimes it's, it's different names and different titles. Okay, now let's look at the process of exploration, okay? Because we, we tried to simplify it down to the max of how you go from idea to business. And what's important is, is a pretty messy process here, okay? And it only gets a little bit more smooth once you've found the right business model. And... A lot of here, what I'm showing, you probably kind of heard it in different flavors, but for us, it's really important to visualize the process as simply as possible. And a good example of a company that actually started out with a great vision up front, 
and explore themselves towards that is Netflix. I'm sure many of you have benefited from Netflix or you put your children in front of Netflix while with during the lockdown, of course, to put them in front of really, really good documentaries to learn. Netflix had this vision here of streaming when they started out, but the co-founders knew that this was not possible at the time with the infrastructures. They actually started with a mail order business model and they explored themselves to here and they learned enough to go towards streaming afterwards. So get, getting towards your vision is a very agile process and which might go through the uh, transformation of different business models. So what is the process concretely? It has two areas. It has business design and testing, okay? So these are two different fundamental things and you go back and forth between these loops all the time. Business design doesn't mean designing a prototype, a physical one. It actually means ideating, coming up with potential business models and value propositions. It means creating a very clear kind of prototype of how that could look on paper. And then moving towards assessing your business design on paper very quickly and then deciding if this is good enough. And you should do that as fast as possible in order to start testing. If you're happy with the design, which might happen in an hour or half a day, here's a big thing. You don't go and build something. It's super important. You start to ask, what are the most important underlying hypotheses that need to be true for this idea to work? And then you design some experiments. And the experiments are, again, at the beginning, rarely to build something, okay? From the experiments you obviously learn, and from the learning you make decisions again. Are you going to go back to the drawing table to change the business design, or do you continue to test? And I'm going to make it very concrete in a second. Uh, Sora, but we still fine with the streaming? Because um, I have a screen here that is not showing up the way it should. Yes. Okay, excellent. Good. So let's just, I'll, I won't go too deep in business design, but it is part of the process of innovation, which requires, again, business agility in the sense that at every stage, you need to have a clear picture of what is the business model you hope to put in place or the business model you hope to change. And I'll show you, we'll use the business model canvas for that in a second. And then you also need to ask yourself how you're creating value for customers. How do your products and services create value for customers? Um, you need to have that in mind all the time. Visualize it. We did this in our first book with the business small canvas to make explicit how you create, um, deliver, and capture value for your organization, okay? Because it's not enough to create a great product or service. So for those who don't know it, quick reminder, 20 seconds, the business small canvas has nine building blocks, and it's not just about how you create value for your customer. For that, we'll use a different tool. It's really about which activities and resources do I need to create value which partners do I collaborate with? And that gives me the cost structure. And if you always have that in mind, if you always have it visual, you can actually, in a very agile way, change these things over time, learning in the field, okay? The front stage of the business small canvas is how do I reach the market through which channels and what kind of relationship do I establish? And then, of course, once I know that, I can ask myself, how am I capturing value with the revenue streams? And the importance here is, and I hope we get there, see if timing is right, we have to think about better business models, not just better products. But while we're trying to go through this process, we look at business models and we look at value propositions, but that's a different job to be done. So we created a slightly different tool for this, which is the value proposition canvas. But I don't want to go too much into this. You can Google this stuff. It's all for free online. What I want to go into a little bit more is the process of testing. Because at the end of the day, success, pretty simple. It's a great business model, a great value proposition, and sound execution. And I believe this is probably the easiest one here. What's difficult is to find a business model that can scale profitably and a value proposition that actually creates value for the customer. This is the fuzzy process that we go through in terms of business uh, design loop. But if we get it right on paper, still doesn't mean it's going to work. And my friend, Steve Blank, who invented the whole lean startup movement with customer development, likes to say there's a fine line between vision and hallucination, right? What looks great on paper, what looks great in the spreadsheet, we all know that, you know, it might not work. And that was what we used to execute with the waterfall. 
um, process. But here is what I also want you to keep in mind is that very, very few ideas make it big. So it turns out six out of 10 investments, they lose money, which means you also need to be, and this is early stage venture capital investments, in the US, you also need to be good at killing projects when it comes to innovation, not just pivoting endlessly until you think you're gonna succeed because some projects should be killed, okay? Now, some, and here's where we need to be very realistic, only few will be insanely successful. Actually, one out of 250 or four out of 1,000, which means the, the likeliness of an idea to really make it big, however agile you are and however you, you know, much you pivot towards new business models, is only very few that will succeed, which means you need to invest in a portfolio, but that's not the topic for today. What I wanna zoom into is the testing mindset and how we can uh, get better at that. Okay, so I showed you the process of testing and we're going to have a quick look at how to do this. So first question is, what are the hypothesis, the uncertainty underlying our business idea? And here we draw on IDEO, the Californian design firm, where you know, they use this for physical design uh, of artifacts. They say you need to test three things. Desirability, do customers want it? Viability, can we make money with it? And feasibility, can we actually build it? Okay, so we overlay this over the business model canvas where I just gave you a quick reminder for those of you who uh, don't know it or know it and, and a quick um, um, introduction for those who don't know it. Here, you can now see everything related to customers and value propositions is here. Do they actually want it? All the questions, the risks related to feasibility, can we build it over here? And then viability, can we make more money from it than we spend over here? And we added one, which is we call adaptability, so the right timing in the competitive environment, et cetera. So these are the risk categories. And unfortunately, companies are often too much stuck in the feasibility rather than kind of focusing from the beginning on desirability and viability, okay? That's where we need to be most agile is to move around there. But the thing I want you to take away from, from this is don't start building something. Start asking what are the biggest underlying assumptions, the hypothesis that you need to test. And there's an easy question for that. You ask what needs to be true for this idea to work. And that gives you all of your hypothesis. What needs to be true for this idea to work? Once you know that, which might be, oh, I believe customers have a budget for this. I believe customers will pay 20 bucks for this. That's a hypothesis, right? Or I believe this customer segment has this job pain or gain. That's a hypothesis. I don't know, if I'm honest, I don't know. So I need to go and experiment, okay? So I need to first clarify the hypothesis so I can start experimenting. And that's why we wrote this book, Testing Business Ideas, is because we believed we can get better at experimentation. Okay, maybe even chat in the type window who believes, maybe you can give your kind of skill level from zero, I'm really bad at testing business ideas, I'm good at maybe an agile process, but not so good at testing business ideas. Give yourself a score of 10 if you are world-class at testing uh, business ideas, because then I can contact you and you can be a case study in our next book. But what we did here is we put down on paper a library of 44 experiments. And I'm going to run you through a couple and then we'll do an exercise, okay? Because I want to make it, I want to get you to think a little bit by also playing around with this. So the obvious, the obvious, and I love it, Holger putting up a six right in terms of uh, um, his, his testing skills. I think some, some of the people I see here I know might be a little beyond. So customer interviews, the first one, straightforward. But look at what I've just put here for every experiment we look at how much it actually costs and we look at how long it takes to run it and then maybe this strong or weak evidence it produces when people tell me that's what they're going to do i don't really believe them it's weak evidence okay we need to start with very cheap experiments that don't cost much and that we can do fast and customer interviews is a good one to start with but it's not enough just to talk to customers in a customer interview. So what's interesting is when you start to make this a sequence. So maybe before a customer interview, you looked at discussion forums. Maybe you talked to your sales force. Maybe you went to Google, did a search trend analysis, okay? That's before we do customer interviews. Or after 
you maybe go on and look at the day, a day in the life of. You shadow, like an ethnographer, you shadow your B2B, your business to business, or your business to consumer customers to learn about them. Or you do paper prototypes, etc. So it's all about the sequence of your experiments and how you move through those, okay? Now, I want to give you um, two, three more um, types of uh, experiments, a little bit more sophisticated interview techniques, and then I'm going to get you to do an exercise. So some of you might have heard of the speedboat, okay? Speedboat is a um, little customer discovery exercise um, that Luke Holman made um, famous in his book, Innovation Games. It's very simple. It's actually also a very cheap one that you can do instead of just doing an interview because it helps you prioritize Maybe let's start with the pains of your customers, okay? So what you do is you take one job or task customers are trying to get done, okay? Maybe, you know, you're trying to learn a methodology. That's your job to be done. And I put this on a wall and say, this is the boat. This is uh, the job I'm trying to get done. I'm trying to learn a new methodology. And now you ask your interviewees to draw an anchor for all of the pains, all of the things that are holding them back from doing that job well. Oh, is a big problem here is time. And the lower the anchor, the bigger the pain. Oh, a big problem is that I first have to find books. That's actually not so hard. I just ask my colleagues, right? So what this does is you start to understand the biggest pains and the, the smallest pains. And when the interviewees see them, they can interact um, and you get a very strong understanding, something you could never do from a free flow exercise uh, interview. Another one is card sort. Similar, but here we could maybe look at features. You, based on your first understanding of customers, so here I drew a little customer profile, or, you know, um, based on, this is from the value proposition canvas, maybe I get a first understanding of the solution. I draw some cards with either the jobs, pains, or gains, or the features of that I have in mind, of something that hasn't been built yet, and I ask my interviewees to kind of force rank them, okay? So I'll give you an example of a company that's done that. Caveat, it's a company I invested in. It's called ShapeScale. They have a pretty terrifying idea here uh, where they create a scale that, does, that makes a 3D image of you. Okay, you don't even need to take off your clothes. It creates a 3D image of you so you can start looking at your exercise goals. And what they did for the features, they created different visual cards and they started showing them to their customers or potential customers. They, they showed it to different segments. And here we can see, oh, tracking the fat, tracking the muscle. Here's my favorite one, uh, the COVID-19 no sports um, feature, if I want to call it like that. It's prediction. Okay, you start to see how you're going to look like if you don't move a little bit more. Or tracking volume. I found this a pretty funny one, right, And in the age of the Kardashians. <laughs> so, uh, See, the Swiss jokes are not very good. We always try. But what they did is they put this in front of their customers and they started to see which ones were top or flop. And those were very different from what they had in mind. Okay, so I talked now for about a half an hour. What I want to do now is get you to do an exercise. So take a little bit of paper and I want you to organize the following experiments I'm going to show you, I want you to organize them into a good sequence. What, which experiment would you do first, second, third, fourth, and fifth? And I'm going to give you a minute for that. Okay? A minute for that. So here we have, you've seen a simple customer discovery interview that's just talking to customers, going to the discussion forum to start to, to see how what, what uh, customers talk about, card sorting, as I've just showed you, speedboat. And here I'll put one brochure means... Um, you know, putting a brochure of a non-existing product or service with some descriptions in front of your customers. Okay, I'm going to give you a minute to perform this exercise. Um, just give me the sequence, the sequence of five letters for a good uh, discovery journey. Let's go. And... When you're done, you can actually type done into the uh, chat window.
So Alex, do you want them to write down in the chat window or do you want them to write the sequence in the chat window? They can, they, if they have the full sequence, they can write it in the chat window too. That's fine. Yeah. Either just done or if they are courageous and they can show their sequence. <laughs> so we're coming in with the first one. It's Nico with B-A-C-D-E. Okay. Uh, we have another one with the same, Arno. Then we have Joshua with C-B-E-D-A. And cool, Peter cool. or Pet with B A D C E yeah. sounds like badge. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A few more okay, seconds. Good. Yeah. A minute was 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 probably pretty good in terms of timing. Here's let me show you what I would have done. Um, I believe this could be a good sequence. B A D C E. Okay. So some of you were close to that maybe. And this is not. Oh, a, oh yeah. yeah Alexander got it. Alexander yeah. got it. And it's not an absolute, you know, it's not a, a, it's not a science, right? So here, let me explain to you why. So I would start with clearly with, with B. Why? Because I want to go into an interview with some initial understanding, okay, of what the customers are actually dealing with, because otherwise my interview is way too, uh, it could be too off, okay? So I start with the going to something there. When I do my interview, I can start to deepen the discovery. And once I've uh, deepened my discovery, I might know enough about jobs, pains, and gains. Now I want to start to class you to kind of prioritize what are the biggest pains, right? So every time I take additional information, bring it over to the next experiment. So I can go very fast. And sometimes I need to be agile enough to go back to the drawing board and change my value proposition that I had in mind. Or I can go on now and say, okay, I understand the biggest pains. Now I'm going to start to design a solution with uh, features, but I don't know which features are most important. So I'm going to do a card sort so I can get an understanding of how they prioritize features. Once I have that, oh, now I can put a PDF value proposition in front of them that already has a ton of information, a ton of evidence from before. So sometimes people say, yeah, but why can't I start with this? Because you might be so off with your first kind of, PDF that you do that you won't know if they don't like it because they don't like your solution or if they don't have the jobs, pains, and gains. So we haven't built anything and we've already gotten really far in terms of understanding. So people generally want to build much too fast is a little bit because, you know, the whole lean startup movement has started out with this build, measure, learn framing rather than, okay, what are the hypotheses that I need to test? And at one point you want to build but it's usually later on in the game because that's more expensive, okay? So a little bit of an insight. Um, and again, you know, some of you might know this, but I think it's really important to get extremely explicit about this. Now, back to culture. This is not really the culture we have in Exploit. And that's okay because it doesn't mean we need to change all of it here. can be that when we create a new app, we try, try to change some, uh, some, some aspects of that, of that process. But it's really here on this side when we are creating a whole new area of, of things that we need to act very differently. And we need to make decisions based on strong evidence, not opinion, okay? Opinion-based decisions are extremely dangerous over here in terms of becoming very costly. So what we created, again, for, for business agility here, we said, we need to be able to score projects. We need to be able to score if this is a business model and value proposition that is on the right track. Okay, so we created the project scorecard. Again, something you can download for free on the internet, just Google it. And the assessment, the, the beginning part is easy, right? That's strategic fit, et cetera, if you're in an existing company, that's traditional. But here it gets interesting. Remember the hypothesis I mapped out? We're gonna start with desirability hypothesis. You're going to score how much evidence the team brought to the table. So here for the first one, we're talking about customer segments. Is it unclear who the customer is and if they actually have those, those, pro, those jobs, pains, and gains? You give it a score of zero. If you have done an interview, you did card sort, you did a lot of different things, you start to give it a high score, then like a 10, because you've ran several experiments. And that is just for desirability, different aspects of desirability. But you will do the same thing for the other risks of your new idea. You will do it for feasibility here. You will do it for viability here. And you will do it also for adaptability, so more environment issues. 
you will give your idea or the idea of the team a score anywhere from zero to 10. And what that allows you to do is make evidence-based decisions. It also allows you actually to, to uh, make the risk profile of an idea explicit because the more tens you can score, and some of these are not based on evidence from testing. Some of these are just, okay, I know my supply chain. I know my cost structure. If that doesn't change, you have very strong evidence. So you can really, really map out the um, risk profile of your idea, okay? So that's what we do in Explore. Now, the big challenge, of course, is, and we're going to get to a, a slightly more complicated exercise in a second, is that this requires a substantially different culture. Culture is the big, big thing when it comes to innovation that we need to unlock, an innovation culture. So we worked with Dave Gray, or Dave Gray, a friend of ours, came to us and he said, Alex Eve, my co-author Eve Pinier, you know, I really want to understand culture. I want to be able to map it out. Can you help me create a better tool? He had great concepts. He had some starting tools. And together, we developed a tool that some of you might know called a culture map. And this is incredibly powerful to design and manage all aspects of culture, but we'll just focus on innovation culture. So the first aspect of the culture map and uh, any kind of culture is the most visible one. What are the behaviors that you can see today in your organization or the patterns of behaviors? And sometimes people like to say the behaviors when people are not looking, right? That is kind of the, what you can see, the, the visible part of culture. And that behavior will lead to certain outcomes. We innovate, we don't innovate. We're agile, we're not agile, right? We focus on quality, we don't. We collaborate, we fight against each other, okay? So those are the outcomes. But you can't really work on these, these uh, areas here. The only place where you can really design and manage culture is at the bottom, talking about enablers and blockers. And if you don't work on this, you're never gonna get strategic agility because you need to put the right enablers in place and take down the blockers that are holding you back from innovating, okay? Big, big thing. And you don't design culture like you design a car. You design culture more like you design a garden. It's a beautiful kind of analogy um, from Dave Gray where he says, here are the elements that allow a garden to flourish, right? It's the enablers and blockers. And these can be formal or informal. Formal could be your salary structure. Informal is the behavior of the team leaders, of the bosses, okay? So it doesn't just need to be formal. And then that leads, this is the heart of the culture, how people behave. And if you get the kind of behavior you want, you will be able to harvest your fruits up here. So I really love this tool. And I remember applying it with a Fortune 50 company where we said, okay, what are the biggest blockers here holding us back? It was with the CTO team, the the team of the technology officer. And then we asked, which blockers can we take, take down within a week? Which blockers can we take down within a month and within a half a year? So very powerful tool. Now let me illustrate this. If you apply the culture map, the first step is about mapping the behaviors that you have today in your organization. Then you start capturing the outcomes, right? And that should usually be pretty consistent if you're honest. Now, this does require a little bit of psychological safety to actually make it explicit. But then the most interesting is to start to identify the enablers and blockers that lead to a certain culture, okay? That is very, very important to make those explicit. And then only, I believe, um, you go towards designing the culture you desire, okay? You could start right away with the right-hand side, but it's usually a little bit better to understand where you are today before you move to where you want to go. Now, let me give you an example of this. And I'll take Amazon, and we can criticize Amazon for many, many things. And I, you know, like any company, we should criticize them for places where they need to get better. But there's one thing they do extremely well, and that's innovate. They have a really, really strong innovation culture, and that's what we're gonna look at. So I'm going to get you, so maybe you can take a piece of paper, it's a bit harder, without, you know, just um, in the mind that the exercise before was a bit easier to do without paper. I want you to map out Amazon's innovation culture with the culture map, okay? So 
what leads Amazon to be able to innovate their culture constantly? Now, it'd be too hard if I just give it to you like this in, in the virtual space. So I'm going to give you some building blocks, and you just have to put the building blocks into the right area here. Is it a behavior? Is it an enabler? Is it a blocker? Okay? So you will take these building blocks and you say, oh, that's clearly an outcome. I'll put it here. Oh, that's clearly a behavior. I'll put it here. Oh, that's a, an enabler of culture or a blocker of culture. I'll put it here. Okay, so I would say enablers on the left and blockers on the right. Okay, so what are the building blocks that I'm going to give you? All of these building blocks come from the annual reports of Amazon. Jeb Bezos writes in every annual report um, about their culture. So here are um, a couple of building blocks, and I'd like you to put them here. If it's an outcome, you put it here. If it's a behavior, you put it here. If it's an enabler, you put it here. If it's a blocker, you put it over here, okay? Now, you don't have any letters yet, so I would like you to classify or put the letters into the right category, okay? Match the letters with the categories one, two, and three. And in the category three, you could put the enablers here, okay? Let's make that even green, the enablers here, and the blockers over here. Okay, I'm going to give you for this exercise a little bit more time, so a little bit more difficult, two and a half minutes. Let's go. It's great, Alex. You get the people working. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I think the conference is pretty long, right? So it's good if they get some, some work in. Okay, I would suggest putting the full sequence or the, you know, this is a bit harder to post, right? I think Jason is doing one at a time, right? <laughs> Good. And I think there's a huge opportunity to copy the culture of some of the most innovative companies, even if you're in a completely different area like banking or finance or pharmaceuticals or utilities, we can copy the culture. Or at least we can copy the enablers and blockers and hope to get to the same behaviors and then outcomes, right? Yep, yep, correct. Uh, you see, I joined your class at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're one of the best students. <laughs> Okay, we got the first one completely in, Nico. Nico for the win. <laughs> Good. Okay, so let me show you the solution. So the easy part was, of course, the easy part was, of course, to put the outcomes. So pretty substantial, right, over the years, what Amazon was able to produce. Um, and I think the, the interesting one here is, is something that the uh, CEO who, you know, Jeb Bezos likes to say this, we're the best place in the world to fail. So he proudly embraces failure because he says you can't, you can't innovate without failing. Uh, behaviors, um, all of these come from the annual reports, right? like a customer obsession, very clear one, taking risks, even if uh, you know, there's uncertainty, willingness to fail. So it's not just that they're agile, they actually kill projects, okay? and they have a really, really strong patience to think long term. Now, you could also say, well, aren't these, these um, um, enablers? Yes, but it, it, they're based on a couple of things that come from the enablers and blockers. So just in terms of, you know, the famous two pizza teams, it's a clear uh, um, enabler of agility and speed. But here's a big one. 
the distinction between changeable and irreversible decisions, right? They say you need to behave differently when uh, a decision is reversible, you can go really fast. When it's irreversible, like building a new warehouse, you might take more time. And of course, bold investments without certainty. Those are the enablers. And then the blockers that Jeb Bezos clearly points out that he says, we do not want to see this because we see that too much in other companies. Here's a big one, one size fits all decision-making. Same way to make decisions in exploit and explore. If you do that, you're not going to get innovation, right? And then of course, the, they say short-term um, focus and slowness, these are all blockers, okay? We don't wanna see that. When people ask um, uh, Jeb Bezos about, you know, is he happy about the, uh, the quarterly results? He says, absolutely, we actually made them five years ago, right? So uh, it's interesting to see that. And all of these come from a consistent investment in um, culture. And we kind of mapped out the culture map for different annual reports or for the letters that Jeb Bezos wrote. So you can, uh, when you get the slides of the talk or you can watch the video again, you can go a little bit deeper to see, you know, there's a strong consistency over the years in terms of how they design culture and what they invest in. Okay, now let me finish off uh, the session very briefly, and I'll do one more exercise with something that's a little bit less about agile, but I do believe, you know, you need to be able to test very quickly and iterate and be extremely agile when you innovate. But what we underestimate is the place where, you know, the money comes from is actually thinking of business design about coming up with better business models, not just products and services. I believe it's practically impossible to compete just on products and services. So I'll show you this idea of business model patterns. We wrote this in our new book. We have two types of patterns. When you invent a business model or when you shift a business model from old to new. And I'm gonna to try to look at both um, with invent patterns first. So here the idea is we're going to use, start like from a green field here. When we have an idea and an opportunity, let's say we have an idea or an opportunity in the market, we're gonna use business model patterns as, as an inspiration to create better business models around our products, and that will give us a real world case. And I'm gonna use an illustration to uh, show you this. The whole thing, actually we have a whole series of patterns. Um, if you're interested in this, you can uh, actually get our new book where we talk about front stage disruption, backstage disruption, and profit formula disruption which is all about different ways of improving and competing on business models. But the one I'm gonna focus on is one of these three. I want you to type into the chat window um, and maybe Saurabh, you can read it out. What do these three business models have in common? The Xbox uh, game console, Microsoft Windows, the operating system, and Apple iPod back in the day. What do these three business models have in common? So maybe people can chat, uh, tap in the chat window and you can maybe see it um, real time. So, yeah, so the, fir the first things that come in, I will, I will read them out loud. Okay, I think, awesome. I think people are still processing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm not gonna read what Alexander Sutler is writing because he was in your class, I think a few weeks ago. <laughs> so Jason Tanner says recurring revenue. Hardware, yeah. all, require, all require hardware purchase, technology, platform idea, evolved over time, digital. Excellent, excellent. excellent. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna give and you the answer. And uh, of course, Alexander knew it, right? We call these all gravity creators. And some of the things that you write are obviously right. I'm just gonna focus on one, which is the fact that all of these companies found a way to lock in their customers, okay? We call this gravity creators. This is what we call a business model pattern. And the pattern is you create a new value proposition for a customer segment, but you're able through the value proposition to lock in customers and increase customer lifetime value because you've locked in the customer, okay? So the example here is uh, that we're gonna look at is iPod in a second, but what's interesting is you can ask yourself always these trigger questions for your new idea. How could you make it difficult or easy for your customers to switch? Or you could score an idea. Here we're scoring the design of the idea. You know, are my customers, can they leave tomorrow? Oh, minus three, not, not a great business design. Are they locked in for five years? Oh, awesome, great business design. Okay, so you can score your business model. So let's look at the iPod because most people, 
when they you know think Apple iPod, which is now an old model, but I love learning from these historic examples, they see technology innovation. But the reality actually is that um, when Steve Jobs pulled out the iPod on stage and said, this is the first time we could put 1,000 songs in a pocket, which was hard back then, what they didn't know, it was a business small strategy. So what I want you to do very quickly is put these building blocks into the right boxes. So what is the sequence of six letters? Okay, and for those who don't know the um, business model canvas really well, I'm actually gonna write it out. Here we have customer value prop. And I guess people can already get started working yeah, on it, right? People can get started, absolutely, right? Channels, uh, revenues. and here, resources. Let's see who gets it first. Who wasn't in my class and who gets it first? Excited, excited. <laughs> See if anybody gets it right. Somehow your explanations vanished again, Alex. Oh, sorry for that. Here we go. Yeah, they're back up. So we have Petra coming in with 1A, 2D, 3B, 4E, 5F, and 6C. Not sure if you memorized the, <laughs> the things, but. <laughs> let's, let's see one or two more answers and then we'll, we'll see. And Petra was all, earlier asking whether the person who gets it right first also gets a copy of the book. And let's, let's say, yeah, we do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So you got two people. Okay, let's go for it. So the solution is actually A, D, B, E, F, C. Okay, that is yeah, right. So Pet here. Petra got it right. Yes. Okay, so um, not too hard, right? A thousand songs in a pocket was the value proposition targeted at the mass market. And they created switching costs. Well, what, what do I mean with that is when people started putting thousand songs in tunes and iPod, it got you know hard to kind of get it out until of course uh, Spotify showed up, but it was hard, you were locked into that. And what did that mean? That would mean that people come back and buy iPods again, right? Again and again and again, so you're locked in. And then in the backstage, if you want, we have, or first the channels, and in the backstage we did need, or Apple did need at the time, um, um, some hardware and software of which they acquired some. Okay, so very strong business model innovation where most people saw mainly technology innovation. And I think it's really important to understand this idea that you can score business models, right? So what I showed before here is we scored one question. How much are your customers locked in? But we do this and you can actually, I think this one we put online as well for free. You don't even need to buy the book for this. Questions for leaders where you can score your business ideas on these uh, nine dimensions. And this is just the design. So you have the best design on paper. You still need to test your ideas, okay? And with that, I'm actually gonna um, wrap it up. Um, so this is the kind of the stuff we're talking about in our latest book. Um, here, we just focused on a small part actually, um, which I thought was most relevant for us today, which was this idea of how do we kind of manage this process. Uh, we didn't look at the portfolio management. We did look at a little bit at patterns here and we spent quite some time on culture. But um, I think this is something we need, just need to get right in companies, the strategic agility part of uh, businesses. So thank you. I think I was a little bit over time. So Rob, I, I hope you're not going to doubt fine. my Swissness. No, no. I, I actually do doubt your Swissness. <laughs> All right, Alex, thank you so much. I just have one question that I want you to ask. Is, sure. You mentioned the chief entrepreneur at the beginning of your presentation. Yep. Now, we had some uh, conversations over Twitter, you and I, on the past few days, 
What yeah. kind of profile do you see in that chief entrepreneur? So I believe it's somebody who should have already done it um, in the sense that, you know, sometimes there's this, this, this myth, oh, we need to bring some, somebody fresh in, you know, from, from university. That's the worst thing you could do. Like, have you ever hired an unexperienced, inexperienced CFO? So you do need to have people who've done it a couple of times. And uh, ideally, they've actually done it in a corporate environment, uh, not just in quotes as entrepreneurs. So the, the, really the, the entrepreneurial mindset of exploration and having done it before, I'd say the experience would be my number one, one part of the profile, um, either as an entrepreneur, even preferably as a corporate entrepreneur. Cool. Alex, thank you so much. We took enough of your time and um, we'll see each other very soon. Bye, Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for listening in.